I know, it's a bubble universe. No, no, a nightmare dimension. Of course, they're all dead, right? Wait, super bright lights and a giant tuba? Yep, it's aliens. Hey everyone, I'm Brent the Middleman, your middle-aged middle manager from Middle America, here today with a video discussing everything we saw in episode 9 of the super fun epic series from. Big reveals this episode as we head into the finale, so grab a shovel and dig until you hit the bottom of the spaceship, because here we go. The episode begins with Boyd and Sarah going over the river and through the woods, but they aren't heading to Grandma's house. Boyd is taking Sarah to the cave he stumbled into when he was lost in the forest, the same cave that had all of the talismans. Back in town, Donna is welcoming all of the Colony House hippies into the police station, mentioning that the one hippie we are just meeting looks depressed. I can't believe someone would be depressed after barely surviving an attack by bloodthirsty monsters and watching all of his friends get disemboweled. What a wimp. We also learn that Bubble Universe guy isn't too happy to be living around the man. This group is just a bunch of negative Nancys. We then jump over to the Matthews house and we see that they've made a whole lot of progress on their digging project. Tabitha then starts heading upstairs, but something is off. It starts to look like a stairwell in a castle or coming up from a dungeon, and we hear this deep tuba sounding horn. The stairwell just keeps going and going until she sees Jim hanging upside down from the roof right before she wakes up in bed. Was this a vision or a dream or reality? This may have been some kind of warning, which means they may be close to finding out what's at the bottom of the hole. As she was going up the stairs, she did find a bunch of Ethan's toys, including the finger puppets from episode 1, letting us know that whatever these things are, they don't like Ethan. At the police station, Donna is woken up and told that the depressed guy hung himself. I was totally shocked. Not that he killed himself, I definitely saw that coming, but that he made a perfect noose. Shame to lose all that rope working talent. We then jump back to the forest where, after some prodding, Sarah finally opens up to Boyd about what the voices told her would happen if she didn't kill Ethan. They told her that her brother would die, which did technically come true, and they told her everyone else would die too. Boyd shows that he believes her and takes off the cuffs. Back at Whole House, Ethan is showing his mom and sister Victor's crayon drawings, saying that they tell a story, they just have to put them together. Obviously, this family hasn't read any Stephen King novels, otherwise they'd listen to the odd little kid. In the drawings, we mostly see dead bodies, but the one of the giant spider jumped out at me. More on this at the end. Up at Antenna House, Jim and Jade argue about the car batteries, and Jade is getting a bit jaded about the whole project. Jim tells him to run off and go get high, that he doesn't need him anyhow. In the other room, Kenny tries to console Donna, but it backfires and she goes all, here's Johnny, on the colony house kitchen floor to help get wood for the tower. It's tough on the survivors to see a strong leader getting rattled, but living in a town surrounded by flesh-eating creatures will do that to ya. In the forest, Sarah tells Boyd that her brother had a theory about the place that if they tried to leave, if they pushed too hard, that something would push back. I don't know about you, but if the girl who seems to be communicating with the entities controlling everything tells me something, I would at least give it a chance. They then come across a tree with a bunch of bottles hanging from it. Boyd can see that there is a message in a bottle and tries to get them down. But the banging bottles cause Sarah to have another seizure, and just like when I find myself around empty bottles, she blacks out. Speaking of blacking out, Donna heads over to the local bar to drown her sorrows. Glass half full Kenny won't give up trying to cheer her up though, and gets her to open up. We learn that she isn't upset about Eric hanging himself, but at the fact that Colony House is gone, and she thinks the whole town will collapse when the antenna fails. Donna drops a very telling line during the conversation, saying that at least in this place, the monsters have the decency to show you who they are, reminding us that everyone in this town had some issues out in the real world. At least in this terrible town, they had a place where people from all backgrounds could orgy and party together. I guess she had never been to Burning Man. Kenny is out ringing his bell and sees Christy looking bummed. She tells Kenny that she and Eric became friends when he came to her with his celiac disease. Yeah, I'd develop a chronic disease too if she was my doctor. She makes Kenny promise that he will tell her if he starts to feel like ending it all. I don't know about you, but this gave me the feeling that something bad is going to happen to one of them. Jade is helping set the table for dinner while complaining to Kenny's mom about how tough it is to be the smartest person in town. Yeah, Jade, I can totally relate. But Kenny's mom doesn't want to hear it. 
She says he shouldn't worry about getting electricity because it's all around them as she flips the lights on and off. This gives Jade a classic aha moment, and I knew right then we wouldn't know what it was until the next episode. Back at Whole House, Julie tells Jim that she is starting to think that maybe Ethan was right that they were brought here for a reason because they are actually acting like a family now. They head down to keep digging the hole when we get some eerie music and see the light flickering. Uh oh, is somebody from the upside down trying to send them a message? Out in the forest, we see that Boyd managed to pitch a tent, move an unconscious Sarah into it, and get down some of the bottles all before nightfall. He shows her one of the messages and tells her they all have dates on them. The one he showed her was from the 1800s. So people have been brought to this town for that long? Is the town redesigned every so often to fit in better with modern times? I'll go a bit deeper on this at the end of the video. Sarah then tells Boyd that she heard the voice again. It was a woman and it was different this time. The voice said she was wrong. There are worse things than the monsters out there. She also says, tell Mr. Fish and Loaves that I was wrong. So yeah, the voice is Abby, Boyd's dead wife, because only she and Ellis would know Boyd's nickname from the military. But before they can talk more, they hear a noise and something huge grabs the tent. We then jump back to Whole House and find that they hit the bottom. Oh, here we go. I'll tell you my theory on this at the end. We quickly go to the forest again where we see the tent and Boyd and Sarah are being dragged through the woods. Holy crap. The tent stops, they hang the talisman back up, and Boyd tells Sarah they're okay. Sarah then says what we are all thinking, uh, I don't think we are, and she is totally right. We hear the tuba horn again, and then a super bright light, then ugh, credits. I really like this episode. It sets us up for a fun finale with three potential huge reveals. First, we have the antenna project at Colony House, where Jade has seemed to figure out the power issue. Second, we have the hole in the ground where they finally hit bottom. And third, we have Boyd and Sarah in the forest with the bright light and loud horn. I think that all three will reveal the same fact, that they are not on Earth, or at least not on the ground. They are on an alien spaceship that is simulating a town on Earth. I think they actually dug down and hit the bottom of the spaceship. It was definitely a metal clunk, and if it was actually Earth, they would not have hit bottom. Everyone knows, they would have just dug to China, duh. The bright light and horn were also very alien spaceship-like. Yes, this could be a huge mislead, playing on our experience with alien movies, but it would explain a lot. But what dragged them through the forest? Are the aliens huge? Was it a tractor beam? Or are the aliens actually giant spider-like creatures like we saw in Victor's drawing? Maybe the town is essentially a giant spider web and they all got caught like flies. And maybe within this simulation, those spider creatures are able to simulate looking like a human being. And if they were abducted onto a ship, that would also explain how they all ended up there from different parts of the country. It could also explain how there are trees with portals that can jump you to anywhere in the area, and how they could be monitored at all times, like how they knew about Kotri burying his bag. It would also explain how the town always has enough food, and how it has been modernized over time to fit with the year it is in. But it also raises a lot of questions that I hope we get some answers to. For one, are they actually awake or are they in some kind of simulation and their bodies are in stasis or something like that? A simulation would be the easy explanation for how changes to the town are able to be made. If the voices Sarah is hearing are the voices of the dead, maybe those people aren't really dead, but Abby was right and death woke them up and they are now able to talk to certain people. For two, why are they only abducting people from the United States? Do they have other ships in other countries doing the same thing? Or is this actually a government program? For three, what's the point of it all? Are they just alien food? Do they taste better when they're afraid? Do the aliens like adrenaline? For four, why do the talismans work? If they are on some ship or in a simulation controlled by aliens or something, then why would they build in something that would help them survive? Is that part of the game or the test? Let me know what you think. Do you believe aliens are at work here, or is it something else? I know this episode must have triggered some awesome theories, so please tell me so we can talk about them. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing, as it really helps this middle-aged middle manager stay motivated to keep pumping out the content. 
I plan to do a comment or theory video for From sometime this week before the season finale, and I'll also be putting out more Raised by Wolves, Severance, and Moon Knight videos. So hit that notification bell if you want to be the first to get your theories in. Thank you for watching. Once again, I'm Brent the Middleman, and I'll see you next time.